Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our next webinar on Meet the Consultant. As I'm sure some of you know from our website, if you've been on there or been on many of our uh, webinars before, um, they're obviously very informative. We obviously get through a lot of questions. Thank you to everybody who obviously who has uh, sent their questions through to the office. We've included as many as we can get in during tonight. Um, obviously, we ask always for the microphones off so that therefore we can obviously hear the speakers or re hear Rebecca fully. Um, so our speaker tonight, we've got Rebecca Thursfield, who is a paediatric respiratory consultant at Old uh, Hay. Um, I must say, before we get started, to, I must thank her, actually, because I haven't done it yet, um, for the presentation that she did previously at our conference only last month. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be there, so she therefore she recorded a whole 20-minute um, presentation, which was thoroughly yeah, uh, excellent presentation. So thank you for that. Um, if you did, didn't did manage to get to that conference, obviously, please do look at our website. Um, the, the videos will be up there at some point once we finish editing them and doing everything we need to do. So have a look at that. And obviously, don't forget to like the videos, but I'll talk more about that at the end. And obviously, Re uh, Rebecca is uh, obviously um, a key driver, particularly for us with the Ocelot project, and again, which was talked about at the conference. So Rebecca, if you'd like to turn your screen on, and we'll say yep. welcome and good evening, and thank you, obviously, for giving up your time tonight. You know, it's much appreciated, certainly by us. Um, you know, because we know how busy you all are. So, um, so thank you for giving up your time. And because my voice is a bit croaky, I'm going to pass over to John, and he's going to ask the first few questions. Thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here tonight and to speak to everybody. Uh, and good evening all from me. So the first few questions we've got about respiratory problems. Um, uh, and I, I guess the first one's going to have a fairly quick answer. Are respiratory problems worse in winter? The respiratory problems are worse in winter, yes. And that's the same for everybody, whether, you, whether you're born with OATOF or whether you're born with any other medical condition or no medical conditions. There are more viruses, there's more bacteria around in the winter time. We do get them all year. You have viruses, you have bacterial infections all year, but they are more prevalent in the winter months for everybody. So yes, there are more respiratory problems around in the winter months because whatever the underlying problem is, it's going to be exacerbated by viral and bacterial infections, which are more prevalent at this time of year. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so it's not special for TOF OA people that this gets worse in winter and that's, that's good to no. know, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, so the next one we've got, how likely is it that respiratory problems would worsen reflux? For instance, when a child complains of have sore throat, could that be reflux as well? So, so when a child complains of a sore throat, that could be reflux. Yes, absolutely. That is a sign of reflux. If the acid is coming up, that can cause a bit of a sore throat. But it's not the respiratory problem that is going to worsen reflux, but more the other way around. If you've got reflux, that may cause exacerbate a respiratory problem so it's not the it's the, the causative element is the other way around but no respiratory problems aren't going to worsen reflux but but that could be a symptom as reflux could cause respiratory problems okay yeah that's jolly helpful thank you very much um, and the the next question we've got sort of relevant to, to this section on respiratory problems. Um, how can parents work with a pulmonologist to determine if children have got asthma or just presenting with asthma-like symptoms? Obviously, that makes a difference to how they might be treated. So if we could answer that question, we would be very rich people indeed. <laughs> that is the age old question. And it's not just talking about, is this asthma or is this a problem of OA TOF? It's the same for any respiratory disorder. Now, whatever your underlying respiratory disorder is, um, common things are common. And, and asthma is common. So just because you have OA TOF doesn't mean you can't have asthma. Just because you have any other respiratory condition, cystic fibrosis, primary syndemesia, bronchiectasis, it doesn't mean you can't have asthma as well. So trying to delve out what problems are caused by asthma and what problems are caused by the respiratory disease is hard, especially in the younger age group. <clears throat> when you get to about six and you can reliably do spirometry, it becomes much easier because you can do spirometry and the, one of the definitions of asthma is a reversible airways disease. And so you, you, you do some spirometry, you have a reduction in your lung function, you take a blue inhaler, you repeat that lung function straight away, and there's a reversibility, there's an improvement that you see in your lung function, 
and that is the definition of asthma. Um, and so if you are old enough to do spirometry, it becomes much, much easier um, in order to do that. Um, but in the younger age group, sometimes it's a bit of a trial and error. It's a bit of a, well, let's try an inhaler and see if that makes any difference. Being very, very careful to stop it if it doesn't make any difference. The symptoms may not be, um, it's it's quite hard sometimes to take away treatments if, if you've still got symptoms. But you have to say, well, actually, we've still got the same symptoms three, two, three months later than we had at the start. The treatment that we've given with the inhaler has made no difference. So we do not want to continue giving that treatment. Um, and it is a little bit of a, a trial and error in the younger age group. And even right, in the you. older ones, it's harder to, to tease out exactly what the problem is, but it is much easier when you can do spirometry. It's good to understand that. You mentioned spirometry several times. Could you just give us a, a minute or so on what that is? Oh, yes, yeah, so anyway, sorry. not too clear. <laughs> so um, it is where you blow into, you you exhale, you blow all of your breath into a machine. You have a, a mouthpiece with tightly sealed lips around it and you blow into a machine and it measures the volume of air that you blow out. And what we we know from a lot of research in the past, how much air you should blow out, which is a pet impacted by your age, your sex, your height. And so you put all of these factors into a machine. It tells you how much air you should blow out and it measures the amount of air you actually do blow out. And we, we're interested in the amount of air you blow out in total and what proportion of that you blow out in the first second. You should blow nearly all of the air out in the first second, tailing off and blow, then expiring the rest of it. Um, and those two figures are really helpful um, at letting us know what's going on in the lungs. Have you got a low lung volume or have you got a lung, a good lung volume, but there's some obstruction there. It takes you longer to get that air out because there's something like asthma that's obstructing it. The airways are smaller and narrower. You can get the air out, but it just takes longer. Um, and those two readings together are helpful in letting us know what's going on inside the lungs. All right. That's extremely helpful. Thank you very much indeed. And the last uh, question we've got under the, the category of respiratory problems. Uh, have you got any recommendations for the environment in bedrooms at night, for instance, a preferable humidity level or temperature? Um, uh, the short answer is no, I don't. Um, you know, we, humidity is not something we particularly think about here in the UK. My guess would be that this is a question from somebody from overseas where you do think more about the humidity. Um, I was doing some reading into this and, you know, you basically, all the papers would say is you want a humidity that's not too damp and not too dry. And therefore, if you live in humid conditions, you want, you know, something to take the moisture away. And if you live in dry conditions, you want something to put the moisture in. And apparently 40 to 50 percent humidity is optimal for sleep. But that's sleep for everybody, not specific to people with their weight off. Um, and that's from a, a sleep expert um, from from overseas. Um, and also, if you have an allergic or asthma component to your respiratory disease, you want to minimize soft furnishings in that bedroom. There's commonly have an um, allergy to house dust mite if you've got that allergic tendency. So minimal teddies, minimal cushions um, around the room or think, you know, if you do have those things, you want to put them in the washing machine. Um, curtains, carpets are minimal if you have that allergic element to it. Otherwise, just whatever's comfortable. That sounds and, very and helpful. People, Thank you. Different people will will sleep better in different environments. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, set of questions that, that are coming from our members, and uh, we'll let Duncan uh, run through those with you, and I shall uh, go quiet for a moment. Yep. Thanks, John. Okay, so we're now on to antibiotics and medication. So the first one we've had is how many courses of antibiotics during a year would you have or recommend before perhaps going on prophylactic uh, antibiotics? So it's a really good question. And um, there's no hard and fast rule. You wouldn't say, well, after this many courses, you would, you know, you would need that. Because at the end of the day, we're all we're all individuals. And you'd want to look at other factors around it. If you have having frequent infections, then I would recommend that you speak to your respiratory paediatrician. If you don't have a respiratory paediatrician, ask or, 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 or a respiratory physician if you're an adult. Um, you know, request one if you don't have one and have a conversation with them. If you're having vi frequent viral upper respiratory tract infections, they're short-lived, 
and you're well in between times, then you're having lots of you know, lots of symptoms, but they're not lasting very long. You're probably you know okay leaving it. If you're having symptoms that are persisting, you know you're only just getting over one one infection. You're getting another one. You're more likely to want something to help you stay well. If you're having chest infections and you're on your third course of antibiotics by November, yeah, it would it would seem to make sense to go on to a prophylactic antibiotic. You're having some more time on antibiotics than you are off antibiotics. That would seem to make sense. And that tends to be what I think. If you're having your third course by, by November quite early on, a prophylactic antibiotic would probably be beneficial. However, if you've got till the end of February and you're having your third course of antibiotics at the end of February... You're thinking, well, we're about to come into the, the spring months. You're probably going to be okay if you're okay in the in the intervening periods in between those episodes. So it's going to be not just a number of courses, but how um, tightly spaced those exacerbations are, how long they last for, how you are in between times. Are you still grumbling with symptoms or are you really well in between times? You're going to want to look at all of these factors. And then it's going to come down to individual factors as well. Some people are really keen to take a prophylactic antibiotic to keep them well. Other people want to stay away from, from any pharmaco, um, pharmacological treatment if they can. And so they may choose to do things like airway clearance as a preference, as a primary treatment rather than an antibiotic. And that's going to be discussion with your team about what's the most appropriate for you, whether you think, well, actually... If I've got the choice, I'd rather avoid the antibiotics and have the airway clearance. Or if you think I'm just not got time to do airway clearance, if I really don't have to wait to do that, I'd rather just take a tablet or some liquid every day. That's going to be easier and preferable for me. Um, but but it would certainly seem reasonable if you're having <laughs> kind of three courses early on to to have a prophylactic antibiotic. Okay, so sort of following on from that, so if somebody's got a recurrent chest infection and it's bit sort of they're on antibiotics and it's been reasonably well managed, is it better to be reactive or sort of like micro proactive um, with the dosage? Um, so if you've got recurrent recurrent chest infections, again that goes back to individual choice and how well you are in between times. So being reactive. So do you want to react to each infection that you get and start antibiotics? Or do you want to kind of be proactive and, and give a prophylactic and prophylactic antibiotics? I think what that is meaning is do you want to be proactive preventing it or do you want to react every time you get it? And it comes back to how often the courses are happening and how well you are in between those exacerbations to what would influence your decision about that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so what's your opinion on Frevia Path? So I had to Google what Frevia Path was because I don't know what Frevia Path is. Path is. And, um, and actually in the UK, we were called that Simba Court. Um, it is an inhaler which is made up of two different drugs, one of which is budenazide, which is a steroid, a steroid inhaler. Um, and the other component of that inhaler is formoterol. So it, um, it relaxes a bronchodilator. It relaxes the, the muscle in the airway, opening up that airway. But it does that um, over a longer period of time. So a lot of people will be familiar with salbutamol ventolin, which is another um, relaxant, a bronchorelaxant. And, um, but this does it over a longer period of time. And so we would, use, we would call that well, the one that I'm familiar with is, is Simbacort. is commonly used in the UK, and it's a good inhaler. It it has a it has a a place. It can be used in various different ways. It has immediate relief um, for the person taking it, as well as long term activity as well. So it can be quite a good inhaler. It's a, usually used as a turbo inhaler when we use it in the UK. So you use it directly into the mouth. You don't have to use a spacer device with it, which can be con convenient for some of our teenagers who are reluctant to carry spacer devices around with them. Um, but it is it is an asthma treatment. It's a treatment for for asthma. It's a treatment for reactive airways disease. And so you would only want to be using that if you had a reactive airways element um, of your of your disease, not not just infections, not just aspiration. Um, it, it's asthma treatment for asthma type symptoms. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so if a child is on a stereo steroid inhaler twice a day, 
um, which is obviously there to help strengthen them. Is there anything else that the parents or doctors can do to sort of help strengthen their, I presume, their breathing? Yeah, so um, I think the first thing to say is that steroid inhalers, you know, can be really helpful, but they don't strengthen the airways. Um, and so I think that's important to understand that you're not you're not making the airways stronger. You're not you're not doing anything to strengthen them. Steroids have a really specific action, and that action is to reduce the inflammation that is there. And it is to reduce the type of inflammation that you see in asthma-like diseases. And that's why we have to be really specific about what it is we're treating when we're giving inhalers. Um, it's normally um, one of the types of, of blood cells, eosinophils. They cause swelling in the airway. They cause lots of cells to infiltrate in the airway. And steroids work on a certain pathway that reduce the inflammation within that airway. And that's what they do. So they're not going to work on any kind of inflammation in the airway. It's that specific um, reactive airways that you see in asthma and other reactive airway type diseases. Um, and so they you get them. They also work in in the older population in, in COPD as well. This is the same pathway where you you can reduce that inflammation by giving these inhalers. Um, and therefore, it depends on the type of inflammation you have in the airway as to whether that's going to be helpful but yes if if you have got reactive airways if it, if it is helpful for you and the steroids are not um doing enough for you you can add in other types of inhalers which are often working on different bits within the airway but all of them combined they open up the airway and they reduce the inflammation we've just looked previously in, in the previous question about the the frevia path or, or the simba cord one of those ingredients in there is is one of these additional kinds of inhalers that you can have on top of the steroid inhaler. So you would always start with a steroid inhaler, then add in additional things, either as a separate inhaler or a combination inhaler, if you felt the steroid inhaler by itself was not working. But the big question, is, if your steroid inhaler is not working, is it, is it not working because it's not strong enough or is it not working because you don't have reactive type airways and therefore that's not the right treatment for for you or your child um and so and the other thing to remember is that steroid inhalers they um they have a, a delayed effect they don't work immediately so they work sometimes over a number of hours sometimes over a number of days and that there's a real there's a lot of different steps in how they they cause that um the reducing in the inflammation it's not a it does this and therefore the inflammation goes away it sets off a chain reaction that stops the inflammation. And some of those effects, um, it it has to stop a reaction that is, you're not going to feel the benefit of for, for a number of days. So steroid inhalers should generally be taken over a longer period of time to assess the benefit, benefit of them. Okay. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, so... Why do our antibiotics work for OATOF children on viral infections when they shouldn't? And how could you explain that, say, to the hospital? So, um, antibiotics kill bacteria. Um, and so they don't, it depends on the antibiotic that you're talking about. And so sometimes they, you know, they're, they're not going to kill a virus, they're not going to get rid of a virus. But they can sometimes settle down the inflammation. We've just spoken about the inflammation that you see in, in steroid type inhalers. But you get a different type of inflammation if you've got an infection. And it's a different type of inflammation, different pathways in the body. There's so many different pathways in the body. Uh, and I did my um, my research degree I finished that in 2012, and, and part of that was looking at inflammatory pathways within the body. And now there are so many more pathways even now than, than we knew existed when I did my research degree, and that wasn't even that long ago um, that I finished that. So we're all, all always discovering new pathways within the body that set off inflammation, new, new cytokines, new proteins in the body that we can, that we can look at. And so the body is really complex and we don't really understand everything within it. But we do know that antibiotics kill bacteria and not viruses, but they also have seems to have some effect, some antibiotics on inflammation as well. 
And so what they're doing is they're settling down the information. They're not getting rid of the virus. They're getting rid of the effects of the virus. Um, and also, <laughs> if you've got problems with your airways, when you do get a virus, your airways are more susceptible to a to a bacterial infection. And so, so you're more likely to get a super added bacterial infection on top of the viral infection that you've already got. But not always. And so just because you have OA TOF and you have a, a cough, it doesn't mean that you that you automatically need antibiotics. The recent recommendations that were that were produced um, by the um, INOEA committee said that you should have a lower threshold for prescribing antibiotics to people with respiratory symptoms with, with OA TOF. So that doesn't mean that everybody automatically should get them. It just means that you would consider giving them at a sooner point than a healthy individual without any medical problems. Um, there's no reason a lot of the population can't get over viruses that you don't automatically need treatment, but you would want to consider them at a sooner point than you would other people um, because of the the risks of you can't clear it, you can't clear secretions from the airway as easily. So when you get a virus, we all know you have a load of secretions in the airway, you get very snotty, very mucousy. And those of us without out away tough, we might feel pretty rubbish, but we, you know, we cough and we get rid of all of the gunk within our airways that, that our airway is producing as a way of keeping them healthy, stopping the infection. You know, it's getting rid of that infection. It's it's good mucus. It's getting rid of all the the, the viruses that are down there. But if you've got OA TOF, there's a number of different reasons why those secretions are going to be more likely to stick in your airway because you've got, you might have floppier airways, you might have some malacia, you're going to have some scar tissue at the site where you've had the operation. Most people who are born with OA will have had that tracheoesophageal fistula when they were first born. So that little connection between the, the windpipe and the food pipe, and that's going to have been cut when you're when you're first born, when your child is first born. And there you get a, a scar tissue inside the trachea at the point that was. Our airways are kept healthy by cilia, little hairs that line our respiratory tract that bat out all of the bad stuff that's not meant to be in the airway. And if you have some scar tissue, then you've got a, a gap there without these cilia and therefore that that's not going to work as well. You can't bat those bad things out as easily. You can't move the mucus along, mobilize it as much. Um, if your airways are floppy, again, they can't mobilize, can't move out that mucus that your body has created to fight the infection, to fight the virus. But then you've got that retained secretions because you can't get rid of it. And therefore, once you've got that retained secretions, sometimes a bacteria can come and cling on to that bacteria are much more likely to invade your your body, your airways, if you've got that mucus that it can cling on to, and therefore it can get into your airways that way. Um, that's great. That's really good. Thank you. Uh, and so that I guess that's why antibiotics are working. It's not that they work in viruses, but they often. But you can see a, a secondary bacterial infection on top of that. But the second part of that question was, how do you explain to the hospitals what to use? And I think that it can be hard because, um, but but hopefully the hospital would know about it. Um, but it depends on on how long you'd have the symptoms for, or your child had have the symptoms for. Um, not everybody needs antibiotics straight away, um, but but if the cough is going on, then it's more likely that they would be beneficial. Um, I th I think there is some information on the TOFS website about that, but but it can be quite difficult. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so outside the normal, obviously, medications that children have when they're babies and vaccinations and things like that, what are there any particular vaccines that you'd recommend for babies, so their parents, siblings with respiratory conditions, obviously, can improve? So we would recommend all children have routine vaccinations. They follow the routine schedule, and that is really important. Um, and it's really important for everybody, but it's you know especially important if you've got underlying respiratory problems that you are protected against um, against all of those. Um, the other thing that is really important is that we would recommend the flu vaccination. 
that's given routinely for children once they get um from the age of, of two, but we would recommend it from the age from the younger age group for those who have OA TOF. So that is a slight difference. We would recommend the flu vaccination, and it would be worthwhile um, family members receiving the flu vaccine as well. All all school children get it anyway, so siblings should be getting it. But it's worthwhile parents having the flu vaccination to prevent prevent spread of that. Um, but otherwise, it's it's routine immunizations. Okay, and the final question from me before I pass back to John. Uh, what are the long-term consequences of frequent steroid use in children and are there any alternatives? So low-dose inhaled corticosteroids um, do not have too many long-term impacts on children if they're giving incorrect doses. We do know that um, steroids, if you give a lot of steroids, then that can cause stunted you know, in childhood. That can cause stunted growth, so children don't necessarily reach their their full potential, their full height potential, um, and it can cause impact on you know the the renal system, the cardiovascular system, um, on the skin. It can cause easy bruising. It can cause bursting of blood vessels on the the surface. It can cause you know overweight, becoming overweight. But that's more the oral steroids than the inhaled steroids. And so the, the purpose of the inhaled steroids is generally to reduce the number of oral steroids that you get to reduce the number of, of complications. And if you have a low dose inhaled steroid, then we wouldn't anticipate seeing any complications um, from if they used at the prescribed dose. And you always have to remember what, you know, you know, in an ideal world, no one would take any medications. Um, but I always you know, think it's important that you look at, well, this is the, these are the risks of having this medication, but what are the risks of not having the medication? And you always have to think of it that way. You say, well, having the, you know, yes, there are side effects of, of having any medication is going to have side effects that go with it. But what about the side effects of not having that? And so if you've got somebody who, who is having breathing problems, you know, who is having problems with, with not able to participate in sport because they're too breathless, not able to have a good night's sleep, their their breathing is impacting on their sleep, then you would say, well, actually, the side effect of the lack of physical activity from not being able to breathe properly and run around and the side effect of having disturbed night's sleep is going to have much more severe and long-lasting consequences um, negative consequences on your health than the inhaled corticosteroids. So it's always important when you're considering side effects of a medication, it's not let's compare the side effect of this medication versus not versus nothing. It's always what is the side effect of this medication versus the side effects of the untreated disease that I'm trying to treat. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you. John, over to you. Well, hello again. Um, hopefully hello everybody again. can hear me all right still. Um, so so we've got a series of, of, of things we want to talk about now about coughs and infections, really, principally. Um, so, so hopefully that'll be okay. And uh, then after that, we'll be able to wrap up the evening. Um, but but the first question we've got about coughs and infections uh, asks really: Do O eight off patients take longer to recover after having an illness? For instance, if a child then has a cough for a long time, how do you know the difference between an extended tough cough recovering and a chest infection going on? What, what signs do you you look for to to know when a cough has become a chest infection? Yeah, uh, um, a really, um, a really good question and a really difficult one to answer. <laughs> um, and so, so we know that people often experience the tough cough, and um, what is sometimes easy to forget is that people cough. Everybody coughs on a daily basis. It's part of keeping our airways healthy. It's part of normality. It's just part of every day. Um, and when studies have been done, people cough an average of um, 20 times a day, the, the population. But you don't notice these things. People don't notice them in themselves. You don't notice it in other people. It's just part of normality, a quick cough here and there. You carry on with your everyday. 
Um, the difference when somebody has what we call the tough cough is because of because of the anatomy, uh, what is often a little bit of a, a malasic airway, the cough is much of a, a much brassier sound. It's a much louder sound. So sometimes it's not that people with a tough cough cough more than other people. It's just that it's a lot more noticeable than other people. Uh, and that's on a day-to-day basis outside of infections. And the same the same goes when um when you're recovering from from an illness, is that is it just you know the fact that everybody would be coughing but you're just noticing it more because it's louder, it's brassier, it's you know it's not not so nice, it's quite a harsh cough, can be quite painful, or is there an infection there? And um part of it is is how how does the person feel? How does the child feel? Clearly much easier once a child is old enough to say how they feel um do they feel that they're 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 getting better do they feel that they're not getting any better um it it will be impacting sleep but how long is it impacting sleep for how how much is it impacting sleep are you coughing things up again much easier in an adult in an old child than a younger child because younger children tend to cough things as far as the back of their throat and then swallow it and so you don't really know if they're coughing things up but does it sound like you're coughing things up can you imagine that you know you've that child has coughed something up does it sound as if there's something there it's a fruity sounding cough it's a wet sounding cough um perhaps it improves after that coughing bout and then it'll come back again later that would be a suggestion that there's some infection there that is lingering that is going on because you've got that wet sounding cough that's being sustained it's not improving and that some antibiotics might be helpful is it you know and is it going is it going on um we know that um coughs after a virus in, in anybody can last for up to 6 weeks but they don't tend to they tend to get you know tend to you know they reach their peak within a week and then they tend to be improving and the cough may may be persisting for a long period of time but it is gradually easing and so you know you know you know has your cough e is it easing or is it still as bad as it was last week you know it's reached its peak and it might have gone down a little bit but it's just stayed at quite a high level for another week and you think this just isn't right now I've just been coughing for for a bit too long um equally people know their own bodies or their children's bodies and so you know i sometimes have patients that come to me and they say you know we try we try and sit it out um and we've done this three times but each time when we get to about day seven or eight you know we then go to the gp and you know we get antibiotics and it improves within a day or two and um, sometimes we've left it for for 10 days sometimes we've gone at seven days um, and they know that when they get that type of cough, if it's not, you know, if it's not improved within a couple of days, they're going to need antibiotics to get rid of it. And so it's important to work with your uh, and make plans with your with your care provider as to what's the right thing for you, because everybody's individual. You know, if you've not had a cough for years and years and years, and all of a sudden you've been coughing for for you know a week. Well, you might want to give it a couple of days because, you know, you've not had anything for a while. You can probably afford to give it that little bit longer to see if you're going to improve by yourself. Whereas if, you know, if you're having frequent infections, you know yourself, you know, you're going to be coughing for six weeks if you don't have those antibiotics, then you'd want to take them sooner. We know that you don't always have, you know, and um chest signs um to listen to when you have an infection it can be hard to diagnose so again working with your um with your team to put plans in place beforehand to say lower threshold for antibiotics i tend to say for my for my well patients who don't have they they don't need to do daily airway clearance they don't need to have a prophylactic antibiotic um i would say you know you'd want to give it a kind of four or five days and see how you're going have you kind of seen the back of it have you reached the peak and you're going to the other side and if after four or five days you might want to add in some airway clearance if that's part of your management airway clearance can be really helpful i've spoken a little bit earlier about the fact you get those retained secretions so what i mean by that is some chest physiotherapy 
that would be percussion in the younger age group where the parents would do formal patting of the back in different positions to get rid of those secretions. In the older age, age group, you'd want to use an adjunct, something you would breathe into in order to really get rid of those secretions from the airways. That would be really helpful and that's something something that I would often suggest after four or five days, you might want to start with that. Um, you know, the airway, cle well, airway clearance may be soon. There's no harm starting it right from the beginning. But if after four or five days of airway clearance, you're not really, you know, making any difference, then would probably be the time to see if you could get some antibiotics. If you are feeling well, obviously high temperatures, if you're having any high temperatures, you're feeling lethargic, poor appetite, um, all of those classic symptoms, then it, then it's much easier to say, well, this is this is looking like a chest infection, just like anybody else, anybody without a weight off, high temperatures can't breathe um you know difficulty in breathing significant you know, breathlessness um poor appetite feeling very lethargic and not able to get out of bed all of these things are pointing to the fact that you know you'd need a medical review because it could well be a chest infection okay look thanks very much indeed for that very full answer and and also touching on on chest physio uh, whilst you were talking uh, a couple of minutes ago we had someone ask a question about whether or not chest physiotherapy might be recommended for oatof patients and it sounds as though there's a yes to that so so thank yeah. you uh, uh, that's that's great well let's move on to the next one on, on this series then um how can you help uh, children with who've been born with oatof treat a bad cough or soothe a sore cough and our questioner here seems to be particularly concerned about those who have difficulty swallowing and can't take over the counter cough syrups and things like that so it's really hard it's horrible if you have somebody coughing and they just can't stop coughing and i think that's the same regardless of whatever the underlying problem is um you know whether you've got somebody with no underlying medical problems or or you know, they've got significant underlying medical problems. It's really hard watching somebody cough and there's very little you can do about it. Um, and even those who can take an over-the-counter cough medication, they don't really work that well in the younger age group. Um, and they're not they're not that great. The only ones that do work are ones that suppress the cough, which is not necessarily that good idea because we're coughing for a reason. We're coughing to get rid of stuff that we don't want in our airways. So you don't necessarily want to suppress suppress the cough necessarily, though. It would be nice overnight to get some sleep. Um, and so the, it's hard. There are many things that we can try to make ourselves feel better as parents but not necessarily any evidence behind anything whatsoever. So I'm not convinced that anything makes a big difference. Some people will swear by having a bowl of steaming boiling water nearby so you can have the steam. Again, no evidence behind it, but you can certainly do that because I think as parents, it makes us feel better to do something. Rubbing the back you know, can make people um, feel better, but it is horrible and, and Again, if you are somebody who's not able, if you've got a difficult, unsafe swallow, so you're not able to swallow anything, it, it must be very difficult for those people. They've got a cough, you're going to have a bit of a sore throat with it. And not to be able to have a sip of water, um, I'm afraid I don't have any any answers other than just, yes, I, I think it's very difficult and, and I... Um, and I think that that is difficult and we need to be working with teams as soon as we can to get children able to take even if it's thickened fluids, thickened fluids as soon as possible because the combination of, of coughing and not having anything orally is not a nice one. Uh, yeah, I wish that I sounds like a real problem. I wish I had it? a magic. Yeah, a magic. Yeah, well, I'm afraid I don't. Clearly that's asking far too much, isn't it? Uh, so uh, next question perhaps we could focus on then. Uh, is it true that chest infections might not show up properly on chest x-rays for OATOF children? And if so, uh, what should should you ask medical professionals to look out for to determine whether or not there's a uh, there's an infection? The, the question also goes on to to ask whether or not antibi antibiotics as a precautionary measure are a good idea, even if an infection hasn't been detected. And I suspect you've already answered that that particular uh, tail end question in some depth. Yeah, so um, it is really hard to work out if it is an infection or not. Uh, yes, you absolutely can have a chest infection without changes. Um, going back to the, the recent publication, you know, the the consensus statement about how we should treat infections, oh, and there's no evidence behind whether you should treat infections only if you've got um, chest X-ray changes, or should you treat it even without chest X-ray changes, and even amongst a, a group of um, 
you know, professionals who are experts in this area, not everybody agreed on it on the consensus statements. Um, everybody agreed that you should definitely treat it if you have chest x-ray changes. Um, and everybody would just say you should have a lower threshold if you don't have chest x-ray changes. We need to remember that you know, antibiotics do have side effects as well um, for the individual and for the, you know for the population. So you know, the short-term side effects of antibiotics, you can have upset stomachs, you can have you know, vomiting, diarrhea, allergic reactions. Um, and so, you know, it's not as if we're we're giving a treatment without any without any side effects. We always need to consider, as you said before, we need to consider what are the side effects of you know the the treatment and what are the side effects of, of not treating. And if it's felt that it's a, a, a viral infection which is going to be self-limited, self-limiting, then I would I would argue that the side effect of having an antibiotic is actually greater than the side effect of of having that viral illness for a little while. Um, and so I think it's important to not just jump straight in there with antibiotics. We do need to give people a chance to get over things without them. Um, because we've also got to consider the longer term side effects as well. This is a group of people who are going to have a lower threshold for antibiotics throughout their life. And if you have too many antibiotics, you may build up a resistance and therefore, it's harder to treat infections when you do need them if you've used the same antibiotic or you know if you've used frequent antibiotics, there may be there may be some resistance built up. Now that may be necessary if you're somebody with significant chest problems, significant respiratory infections, it's causing significant problems. We have to accept the fact that we have to deal with antibiotic resistance later in life to treat the here and the now. And so for some people, that is the right decision. Let's use lots of antibiotics in the here and now and we'll deal with the problems later. But but for some people, actually, do we need to do that? And it's always need to consider that what is right for that individual in front of you there. And it's not going to be the same for, for two individuals who have got the same underlying diagnosis but may have different features about their the courses of their disease, how they are between them, how often they are. Lots of different factors around it will will impact whether you're somebody that you want to say, well, let let's try and you know prevent you from having that antibiotic and build up that any potential resistance. Versus actually, we need to protect your airways. We want to stop you from having any long term long term scarring. Let's give you lots of antibiotics now. Um, and you know, and we'll deal with any any consequences because that's going to be better than than dealing with the scarring that we think you might get if we don't treat with a lot of antibiotics now. So we need to be clear about what it is we're treating. Um, you know, lots of other factors that go go with it. And remember that antibiotics, yes, they are very helpful, but they do have side effects. Okay. No. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a very short question next, but uh, I've got a suspicion the answer is not terribly short. How do I know? I think I think that means the parents. How how does anybody know if a child has got tracheomalacia or a virus? Okay, so um, so tracheomalacia is there all of the time, whereas a virus will not be there all of the time. Um, but um, and so you either have tracheomalacia or you don't have tracheomalacia, and so you know you would you would over a period of time you would want to to evaluate if you, you would expect tracheomalacia to be causing problems um you know potentially at a different point potentially on on ex on exercise or, or in sleeping if it was severe tracheomalacia it could potentially cause problems outside of having a virus having said that if you get a virus it's going to be worse if you have tracheomalacia you've got those secretions there you're going to retain them more if you've got malacia you build up a, a layer of mucus within the airways and therefore if they're malacic and closing down, they're going to be smaller when you've got a virus um, because you've got malacia. And so I think it's, if you've got tracheomalacia, you're going to be more impacted. You're, you might well be more impacted when you have a virus than if you don't. But either way, if you're well outside of a virus, it doesn't really matter if you've got tracheomalacia or not. We do we do have various treatments for tracheomalacia, um, but you would not really be wanting to to go down any of those routes if you were only having symptoms of your malacia during a viral infection. 
we would really only treat trachea malacia if it was impacting your breathing when you were well on a day-to-day basis because we're talking about um, a breathing machine overnight to keep your airways open. Um, we're talking about an operation to um, attach your your trachea to your um, to your one of your big heart vessels in order to to keep it open. You're kind of stenting it open, um, or you're talking in in its extreme form to treat tracheomalacia, a tracheostomy, in order to keep um, to, to bypass or to stent the the trachea open. So treatments for tracheomalacia um, are quite um, quite significant, um, and so you wouldn't really be going down that route um, unless you had day-to-day symptoms. Um, but if you're having finding that you have difficulty breathing, your child has difficulty in breathing every time they have a virus, they may well have um, they may well have trachea malacia. Um, if I have a child in my clinic who is having difficulty breathing every time they have a, a virus or they're having frequent viruses, I will often want to evaluate that with a bronchoscopy. And so I would take a child to the operating theatre and have a little look down. It's not an operation, more a procedure. Um, in us adults, we would be expected to have our bronchoscope done wide awake. Um, well, a little bit of sedation, but in children, we put children to sleep um, for for ease. And um, so they have a camera put down for those who have not had done it goes down. I would say take a big breath. And if you imagine where that air has travelled, that's where the camera travels. So it doesn't make any holes that aren't there. It travels exactly the route that the air goes. So that camera goes down into the airways, has a look around and, and evaluate for tracheomalacia. And um, and that's if I've got patients in my clinic who have frequent infections, then I would be wanting to do a bronchoscopy to, to look for malacia. We can't necessarily do anything about it, but it can be very informative and it can help guide our future management plans and management strategies by knowing that it's there saying well we know that there's malacia we know you're going to be more impacted by a virus let's start your airway clearance at the first sign of any infection or you're having so many infections let's do airway clearance even in between to really keep those airways as clear as possible not allow any buildup of secretions to keep them as pristine as we can so that they're in their best possible health when you do experience get exposure to a virus okay well that's very helpful thank you very much a clear distinction there between the two things tracheomalacia and a virus um the next question i i think you might well have answered some of this already so please feel free to give us a, a brief one but how do parents know when to seek treatment at what stage for instance uh, having a one-year-old who often has cough wheezes and rattles etc but otherwise seems okay um, so I would want to see a one-year-old who often has cough, wheeze and rattle. Not urgently, they're otherwise well. Um, but all of these children should be under a surgeon um, and your surgeons will probably have links with with the respiratory team. And so I would want to see, you know, if you would uh, do a surgical review, mention it to your surgeon, who can hopefully make that referral or go and see your GP and um, and, you know, make that referral to the respiratory team and that's exactly who I would want to see and then it's my job to work out are you is that one-year-old having more respiratory problems than the other children in their nursery all one-year-olds have respiratory problems you know you go out into the street and you ask the parent of any one-year-old if they've got problems they're all going to have coughs wheezes and rattles that's what one-year-olds do but is it something more than the norm that's my job to work out and so I would want to see in fact you know I would want to see anyone with respiratory with frequent respiratory symptoms in my clinic so I can make that assessment. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Very clear. Um, next question and to a different sort of area to some extent, bronchiectasis. Do you have any updates on treatments and long-term management for bronchiectasis? I hope I pronounced that something like right. Yeah, bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis, for those who are not familiar with that term, is scarring of the lungs. And so you get um, the the airways that with the oxygen, the air travels through to get to the end of our airways and they become dilated, they become bigger and um, the, the airway walls thicken and they, they kind of get baggy bits of airways. And the problem is once you've got those baggy bits of airways, 
then it's really easy for bacteria to sit in there. They go, oh, lovely, a lovely little bit of baggy airway for me to sit and hide away in. And so once you've got bronchiectasis, then there are, you know, it's it's very it's much easier for for bacterial infections to sit in there and then to make it worse and to have more chest infections. So the aim is to try and prevent bronchiectasis in the first place by the strategies that we've already spoken about, by having a lower threshold for antibiotics, um, by having airway clearance for those that need it, by seeing your, you know, your speaking to your team if you're having recurrent respiratory infections. Um, but then if you do develop bronchiectasis, then we know that we need to be extra vigilant at doing all of these things that we've spoken about because you're more prone you are more prone to having bacterial infections once you've got that bronchiectasis there so an even lower threshold for antibiotics if i've got patients with bronchiectasis i will often give the parents the antibiotics to have at home to start again not straight away with a cough we want people to try to get clear their coughs without it but um perhaps after kind of um you know, three days if the if the cough's getting worse, not seeming to improve with any you know with any of the airway clearance, then you may want to start the antibiotics a little bit more promptly. Nebulizers to help get rid of the um, get rid of the secretions can be quite helpful, um, and airway clearance. Some people with bronchiectasis will not need any of these things as a routine basis, and they will just have some antibiotics when they get an infection every now and again. Um, but other people will need to have nebulizers, prophylactic antibiotics, and daily airway clearance. So it's very individually in based. But these that's your that's your mainstay of things are airway clearance, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, very be proactive with courses of antibiotics and nebulized treatment. And the other the thing that's really important in bronchiectasis, well, any respiratory disease, is physical activity. It's so, so important to have physical activity. And this is one of the things that we try to instill in all of our patients. All of us, without exception, should be having regular exercise on a daily basis. That's kind of NHS guidelines. It's common sense. We need to be fit and everybody, we should be fit and active. We should be taking regular exercise and we should be, you know, active on a daily basis it's not just about doing an hour of football a day what you do for those remaining hours of the day you know we want to be getting active we want to be active individuals and all of this is so much more important if you've got an underlying respiratory condition it's so much it's really important to to make the most of the airways that you've got to be in the best respiratory health that you can be and that means doing the things that we all should be doing but be really focused on it and I always say to parents of, of young children um, that you have a real a real influence to make in your child's life because as parents of a toddler, you can influence the clubs that they go to. You, know, you can take them to dance classes or soccer soccer tots or whatever it is that, that you might want to take your young person to. And so you're setting their, their trajectory for life about whether they're going to be an active individual. Um by the time you've got a 12, 13 year old, good luck convincing your 12 or 13 year old that they want to go and do some exercise if they haven't done it um, from a youngster. Uh, and so, uh, and it's also about it being a family activity. I'm saying you can't be sitting there watching a film with your other children on a Sunday afternoon saying to your other child, well, you go and do your exercise outside now whilst we're all in inside. Um, watching TV. It's about the whole family, the whole family's impact to go and be healthy, go on a walk, go and do some physical activity together. But that's one of the best things that people can do for for their child's respiratory health is be be an active family, encourage that child to, to grow up being an, an active child. When you've got teenagers, you're either going to argue with them to come in because they want to be out playing or you're going to be arguing with them to get off their technology devices and you want to be arguing to get them in, not arguing to get them off their devices, to get them out. And um, so that and not smoking um, around them are going to be really important things that you can do 
uh, as a family for any respiratory health. We've kind of got off, gone off the topic there of bronchi exercise, but that's kind oh, of what useful point for that. Perhaps, so thank and, um, you for that. Thank you for that. And, um, could could I um, see if I could move on to the next one? Because I've got one or two relevant extras popped up. Okay. Um, the next question is to do with croup and the question, how, how can parents help prevent croup in winter? But there's a, an additional question which has come in from another member um, and more broadly saying, are children with OATOF more likely to suffer from croup in particular? Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe children who've been intubated, would that uh, make them more likely to suffer from croup? So, so yes, children... With OA top, if you've got some um, laryngomalacious, um, so croup is just croup is any viral infection that affects that bit of the upper part of the airway, and so you get a swelling of the upper part of the airway, which gives rise to that classic croupy cough, um, and then, and then that inspiratory, um, on on the in breath, so you have the the croupy cough, followed by the the stride or the the on the of the in breath and and that's what croup is it's a viral infection so they're no more likely to get the viral infection than any other child there's nothing wrong with their immune system but if they have some floppiness of that airway if they have some narrowness of that airway from previous intubation then they are more likely to get that classic croupy cough with that stridor than another child on the street so um they are more likely to need to be going into hospital to get that that steroid course you don't necessarily need steroids if you've just got the croupy cough, but it's if it's impacting your breathing, if you're struggling to breathe or got that, then you would want to to see somebody for some some medical attention to get to get treatment if if your child had had stride or or difficult any difficulty in their breathing. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we have almost got to the the end of our list of questions, and the timing is brilliant, I must say. So thank you very much for that. Um, somebody wanted to know what are the pros and cons of assisted cough or cupping for unproductive cough. I have to say I'm not entirely sure what that question means, but hopefully it makes more sense to you. Yeah. So um, so assisted cough. Um, I'm presuming they're talking about airway clearance. Um, we do have assisted cough like uh, machines where the 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 machine can cough for you but that wouldn't really be something that we would ever use in this population we we only ever use um cough assist um cough assists um for patients with um neurological problems if you're not able to generate a cough then we would want to use an actual cough assist to cough for you so that's not really what i want to talk about here because our population are, are very well able to cough um but it's about getting them to, to cough the cupping um, is something that you can use for a type of percussion for the airway clearance so parents can do percussion we in the uk tend to prefer hands um our physiotherapist certainly at alder hay our physiotherapists prefer to use um, their hands for percussion rather than a cup you can buy cups and, and do the percussion with a cup instead uh, that's absolutely fine if people prefer to do that it's personal preference our physios say that if you, you're using your hand, you, you can feel what's going on. You can feel things a lot more and be a lot more reactive. Um, but either way, what you are doing is you are moving those secretions from the end of the airways up to the higher points of the airway so that it can be coughed out. And um, it's certainly in older children, adults, you would follow that um, cupping, percussion, or in the older children, the, the maneuvers with the machines, um, and by then coughing and huffing to move the secretions from the upper parts of the airways to get it out. Um, and it's it's not needed for all children. We don't want to be putting things into people's lives that they don't need. Not everybody needs to have airway clearance. Not everybody needs to have chest physiotherapy. Um, and you would need to be seen by a physiotherapist to assess the need for airway clearance. Um, if you've got a dry sounding cough, it's not particularly going to help. But if you've got a frequent wet sounding cough, frequent infections, problems with retained secretions, then then yes, having um, having airway clearance by whatever means, um, cupping is one of them. That then that would be helpful with or without nebulizers. Again, for some people, the the cupping, the the percussion itself would be enough. For other people, that still wouldn't shift the secretions enough. You'd need to add in a nebulizer to loosen them before doing your manoeuvres to get rid of that. But it wouldn't really be for an unproductive cough. It's more for a an unproductive cough that you feel should be productive. 
um, would be where you would use it for. So kind of to shift those secretions that you think there. If it's a truly unproductive calf, truly dry calf, then no, you don't need it. Thanks, thanks. You mentioned nebulizers a couple of times there, and indeed in a previous uh, question about bronchiectasis, and one of our members has just sent something in saying, what kind of medications might be recommended uh, with a nebulizer in the case of bronchiectasis or indeed any of the ones you just mentioned? Yeah, a really good question and one I should have said. So literally just um, saline, which is salt water, um, and we don't tend to nebulize anything else. I know that in, in some countries people do nebulize subutamol, um, we don't recommend that in the UK. All of our sabutamol is delivered in inhalers, not in a nebulized form. There are exceptions to every rule, but, but as a general rule, our nebulized that I'm talking about are literally saline to to break down that mucus. You have got other things to break down that mucus as well. We can use pulmozyme is used in um, cystic fibrosis, but there's no evidence that it's beneficial outside of cystic fibrosis. So the main one is saline. Um a weak, a weak salty. So, so saline is just a salt water, very weak, 0.9%. Or if you want a saltier one, that can sometimes make you cough more, um, but it can be more effective. We would use a 3% saline nebulizer or a 7% would be the strongest one that we'd, we would use. So they would be our three main options would be a 0.9%, 3% or 7% saline or salt nebulizer. All right, that's very helpful indeed. Thanks very much. But I think I get the, that gets us really to the, to the end of our, our list of questions. So uh, I think perhaps I'd, I'd better say thanks very much and pass back to my colleague Duncan and, uh, and allow him to, uh, to close out the evening. Thanks.